This is our 10th international roundtable in a year, but unlike the previous one, it is part of a large program of civil society discussions organized like ours on a short notice in support of the Summit for Democracy initiated by President Biden. There are dozens of very worthwhile events around it and I encourage you to check them on the website summitfordemocracy.org. There has been some vigorous debate on whether the summit should prioritize domestic defense and expansion of democracy or countering authoritarianism internationally. But for many of us, one is inseparable from the other. That's why we chose to bring up the topic of political exiles, an often overlooked group of stakeholders in both domestic and international success of this summit. As immigrants with strong opinions, at times too strong for some tastes because of their heightened sensitivity to the erosion of democracy and to corrupt influences from their native countries upon the West, exiles are often a domestic factor in their new countries. Those of them closely connected to democratic and human rights struggles back home may still be an international influence there. And they are a transnational factor too, affecting at least somewhat bilateral relations, even by their presence in a new country let alone if their old government is bent upon transnational repression, which does not always mean dramatic kidnappings and murders, because in my community, transnational repression has been mostly low key. It relies upon vast Kremlin connected funds invested in Western institutions back when these funds were welcomed and even solicited. The influence they bought has been used for many years to divide the exiles and to misrepresent them to Westerners in the words of John Kennedy, foreign policy is too important for all of us to leave it to the experts and the diplomats. The Summit for Democracy is that rare chance to open it up to transnational voices, not just from corporate elites, but also from the middle and lower layers of society. In fact, one such political exile who grew from a humble start into an internationally recognized leader, arguably is the most effective and unifying from our part of the world. And I mean, of course, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. And we learned last week that she will be invited to the summit speaking there, which is hugely positive news, not just for our Belarusian friends, but for many others. The study of immigration has many aspects. One of the most interesting of this to me is immigrant identity. Uh, my uh, discovery and study of the Russian Anzacs, about a thousand natives of the Russian Empire who enlisted in the Australian army in the First World War, allowed me to see how the Anzac legend, uh, the cornerstones of which are mateship, egalitarianism, and uh, to use the uh, OC expression, a fair Zinkungo works with the other, the people uh, of other ethnic origin. The story of a Ukrainian servicemen, uh, Theophil Volkovsky, a former teacher and political immigrant, is telling in this respect. After the war, he uh, married an Australian woman and became an outback farmer. Volkovsky wrote numerous letters to the editor in the local newspapers, about which Tom told me, Dad would always write in the paper about things like kangaroo problems, always writing to a minister for this and to a minister for that. He started an organization called the Western Settlers Association. He fought very hard to get a high school at Kabar, and he succeeded in getting that, and he fought for a school hostel for the kids from the land, uh, so that kids from the land could stay at the hostel. Uh, that succeeded too. At the same time, in Tasmania, another Anzac, the Belarusian Simon Suchkov uh, advoc advocated uh, in his letters to, uh, for grassroots farmers' rights, local roads, and boarding school for kids. All this might seem quintessentially Australian problems, but where are they? I recently contacted farmers in Idis Creek, Tasmania, in hopes of finding out something about Simon Suchkov, who had no family and died there over 60 years ago. To my surprise, I discovered that his neighbors still remember and cherish him, preserving his papers, medals, and his pipe. Among the country roads, one of which is 
known as Suchkov Road, beneath high, uh, high eucalypts, he erected a different kind of temple in the memories and souls of people who, thanks to their Belarusian neighbor, grew up without xenophobia. My humble contribution to this uh, important discussion is um, I spent many years writing and producing a journalistic thriller, a dramatic film, not a documentary, but a sexy action adventure film called Mr. Jones. Um, the film Mr. Jones that Agnieszka Holland and I made together is the story of the little known independent Welsh journalist, Gareth Jones, who risked his life to expose Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine and how the truth was buried, how we had a battle, not just the Kremlin and Soviet propaganda, but also powerful Western journalists who were in the pocket of Soviet propaganda and Western governments like the British government and the US government that were happy to open relations with the Soviet government if it meant doing business together and profiting together. I, I wrote and produced Mr. Jones inspired by my grandfather, who was the world to me growing up uh, in an Im Ukrainian immigrant family in California. My grandfather was born and raised in Donbass. He experienced uh, life in Ukraine under Stalin. He was a little boy watching the Russian Revolution being fought on his farm between barefoot, tattered Bolshevik soldiers and, and the Tsar's army. He um, survived Stalin's genocide famine as a young man, and then he was arrested and tortured as a young father during Stalin's purges. And uh, so his whole uh, life story, he wrote down shortly before he passed away, and he left me that manuscript, and I took it to Ukraine and had it translated from Ukrainian into English, and a lot of that research went into the making of the film Mr. Jones. This film was made because of Ukrainian diaspora organizations and communities across the U.S. and in Canada and in Europe. In the Ukrainian diaspora, we, of course, every November come together globally uh, as a global diaspora community to honor the many millions of victims of Stalin in, in the month of November for the Holodomor, Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And just the fact that we know every November the global Ukrainian families coming together, it's November, November is coming, that annual event that, that we're all anchored in as a community, that has a lot of power in creating all types of ideas and community connections and events. That's been a launching pad year after year. So every year when I was struggling to get Mr. Jones made, I knew that I would see the Ukrainian diaspora, all the leaders, all the community, all the funders, all the local credit unions, I would see all the big um, organ organizations that November, and we could plan events together to get the, to build awareness of, of the of the famine. Uh, and in doing that work together year after year, I was able to build the relationships needed to fund the film Mr. Jones independently. And it was by pulling together this finan these financial resources at, from, the from the Ukrainian diaspora community, pulling together these important relationships, we were able to, as a di diaspora community, produce Mr. Jones, a film that Hollywood did not want to touch. Uh, the film that Andre was talking about is part of that preservation of, of historical truth and of where we come from. And that uh, is our... Um, asset that we can, uh, that helps us to uh, contribute constructively to the protection of democracy and human rights in whatever country we find ourselves in. And I have been in this country uh, for over 40 years now, and I can see to my great dismay that human rights are not as much on the agenda anymore. Uh, uh, as they were in the uh, 1980s, for example, the, um, uh, the understanding of these issues becomes more and more vague, more and more kind of diluted. Uh, we, we have a very uh, uh, determined regimes 
in, in my home country, in my motherland of Russia, to crush any independent uh, uh, activity, be it an organization or a group or an individual even now. And we have to find a way to bring the attention of uh, our legislators. We have to be really uh, aggressive, thoughtful, determined. I have no theoretical knowledge about political immigration, but I do have practical one. Already for 15 months, uh, Alexander Vasilevich, my husband, uh, has been in prison. He's also a political prisoner, and uh, I spent 10 hours under uh, interrogation and became a suspect in a criminal case. And after leaving uh, the interrogation, I found out that my husband would not get out of there, and that so many people's homes and offices has been searched, including mine and my parents' apartment, our gallery of contemporary art, my agency office. Uh, after two months, I was able to leave Belarus, and since then, I lived in Estonia. Here, I gave uh, birth to our second daughter. She's uh, one year old now, and a date for her is just a photograph on the wall. People face it a conscious choice between immigration and prison. There are many people who choose have chosen immigration. And uh, I'm personally very grateful for them for this choice because they can continue to influence the situation. They do so through unimaginable personal challenges. Svetlana Tikhanovska is a leader for whom the Belarusians gave their votes first and then their hearts, talks about Belarus at her meetings with the Western leaders knowing that her husband is going through a closed court, which will issue a ridiculous sentences in actually in two weeks. Svetlana and uh, the immigrated Belarusians create working structures that continue to fight for the right of Belarusians and are preparing reform, creating a system that can be transferred to Belarus after. I would like to quote a Belarusian writer, Vasil Bikov, he told, uh, said that uh, the Belarusian diaspora had become uh, part of the democratic world and it's free from many of the shortcomings which the citizens of the recent totalitarian states are inherited. The historical role of the Belarusian diaspora is that it was the first who, um, to rise from its knees. The diaspora preserved essential elements of the national culture kept her native language pure and remained faithful to the idea of national revival. And this is how Stasha Romanova, the editor of the, this online publishing house, describes political immigration. You are not an economical refugee who sold an apartment, a calculate life in a new place for a year ahead. You are a political one who abandoned everything as it is put the cat in good hands and sailed off into the unknown with one suitcase. The motive is simple, not to communicate with the KGB, not to sit in a dumb cell, not to be afraid of a knock on the, on the door, not to let your children carry your parcels to prison. We are all not ready to call our situation immigration. It seems that tomorrow it will be possible to come back home with experience, emotion and knowledge of how to build a new and ideal Belarus. In my opinion, this involvement in the life of another country is perhaps the second massive advantage after the feeling of security. People who live in free countries while returning bring what many residents of totalitarian country do not have, the confidence that there should be zero tolerance to violence against human rights. This also works in an opposite direction. Exile from totalitarian countries has the ability to recognize the site of non-democratic action in their new home countries. They can be the first who light the signal fires. Despite the high cost of protest, people in Russia continue to fight for their rights every day 
on the social portal activatica.org, our team publishes new news about civil activity throughout Russia. Where citizens manage to organize a systematic and massive protest, they manage to win. It's possible in Putin's Russia. The most significant victories of civil society in Russia in recent years are the victory of Shias against the landfill in the Arkhangelsk district and the victories in Bashkortostan, where activists defended the unique nature territory. The authorities take revenge on citizens uh, for their victories. For example, an activist from Shias, Borovikov, was imprisoned for two years for simple reposting on Vkontakte a clip of Rammstein rock band. The authorities discredit, discredit activism in Russia. For example, uh, they allow Stalinists to hold rallies on important social topics while banning any other attempts to care out public events on such issues. We are also obligated to help activists in danger to evacuate from Russia, to help with integration in new places. Our new priority is to preserve the life and health of activists and help activists both inside Russia and outside Russia. Our main problem is that uh, Europe uh, continue to collaborate with Putin's regime and continue to buy from Putin gas, oil and other natural resources. It's a huge problem and at this moment I think it's extremely important to stop Nord Stream 2 project. Why it's important? Because Putin regime, unfortunately, to use this money from Europe for disgusting needs, for propaganda machine, for military campaign against our neighbors, against Ukraine, against Georgia. And I think it's really very bad uh, for uh, human rights on Russia. We, uh, Europe continue to pay for Putin's regime. Putin's regime continue uh, to pay for Silviki, uh, for police, uh, for FSB, and they continue to press of civil society. I kindly ask uh, uh, Congress of USA and State Department to organize sanctions, strong san sanction against the Nord Stream 2 project. I think that we need uh, uh, to ask uh, Biden administration uh, to demand from Putin's, uh, uh, from, uh, Putin's authorities to release Alexei Navalny immediately. And uh, well, I think that we, uh, we need uh, uh, to ask Biden uh, to, to demand from Putin to stop uh, uh, pressure to uh, memorial immediately too. And uh, if, we are, uh, uh, if we speak about support of Russian civil society, I think that at this moment it's extremely important to continue to support independent NGOs from Russia. Because a lot of NGOs, independent NGOs, uh, were forced to move to Europe, to America, and continue their activity uh, out of Russia and they continue to organize services for grassroots groups and it's extremely important uh, to support them. Dozens of uh, activists from Navalny structures became on prison and it's a really very, very dangerous for them. And uh, I think that we need to help them to evacuate from Russia. And, and it's so simple uh, to buy tickets uh, for them, but it's so difficult for this uh, simple people from Navalny structure to buy uh, a ticket from Russia to Europe. It's really a very uh, high cost price for them. They don't have money. And I think that it's really a good idea to organize a special foundation and help for activists from Navalny structure to evacuate from Russia and uh, help uh, them 
on uh, new places because I uh, I'm sure that these activists continue uh, uh, their activity uh, on Europe, on USA. It's really extremely important to keep life and health of activists. 20 years, I have been an active uh, participant in the Ukrainian political life and numerous times have had a skeptical and sometimes cynical statements about the influence of the diaspora on the life of the country. For example, do not teach me how to live, just help me fi financially. As life has proven, this um, did not help in order to rule a democratic, uh, democratic society and to live in it, we have yet much to learn. The size of uh, the Ukrainian the diaspora is about 1 million. Almost 100 years have uh, passed since the founding of the first public organization. Today, uh, they have almost 60 of, of them. They are different. Some um, of them are more active in political life, scientists, education, as in the cultural, religion, and or financial. financial. They have um, unconditional unity in one sense, helping their homeland, where the war is still going on strong after seven years and almost uh, 14,000 um, 14, Ukrainian soldiers and uh, volunteers who have died at the front. Ukrainian uh, youth in the U USA that created a volunteering organization that in the cooperation with veteran organization uh, bring the uh, one, one wanted uh, the treatment and uh, rehabilitation. This organization also helped the family of soldiers killed in war. They continue to lobby for the government bills uh, that uh, will uh, help end the war. Of course, we feel a lot of uh, solidarity and a lot of support from uh, Europe and from America, uh, United States. Uh, but um, we have different feelings of time. I mean that I spoke to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya about work and about uh, any decisions that can be made in uh, her team. And she told me that um, we have another feeling of um, time, of hour, of days, because Every day for us, it's a day um, what our, um, that our uh, loved ones uh, spend in prison. And no one will ever help us to return those. Western country uh, do a lot. Um, but actually, I think that this pressure is not enough right now. And we have to um, support uh, democratic forces um, and we have to pressure the regime and stop trading with, uh, with them.